They speak of a moral majority that has been very effective in the last election to defeat many of the compassionate people, many of the most liberal congressmen who were concerned with the needy, the elderly, the poor, with the environment. What is their program of the moral majority? You turn on to any television station this morning, or radio, you'll hear the same preaching. What do they preach against? What is the moral majority? They say that you should introduce prayer in the public school, as if this was going to solve the problems of a very intricate, complicated community. They say that you must abolish or rather reintroduce the death penalty. They say that you must not permit people the right to control their families. This is presented as religion, the moral majority. What should the moral majority be? The moral majority should take its stand on the brotherhood of man, compassion, and I must say this to the credit of my people. I told them yesterday morning at the synagogue, while many of them are prosperous to islands of poverty, by and large, when it comes to a national election, they will vote against their economic interests. Very interesting. They may have a ranch-style house in the suburbs, might even have a swimming pool. They may be in the upper brackets, and Mr. Reagan promises them with continuous reduced taxation taxes. They're going to vote by and large for the liberal candidates. Why? Because the whole tradition of the Bible is one of compassion, one of concern for one's fellow man. And I think my Christian colleagues miss a great deal when they emphasize the, only the New Testament part of Holy Scriptures, and both are sacred, which is basically a teaching of salvation, of guilt and redemption. They should use the Hebrew Bible. I've spoken to some Christian colleagues at their convocations and conferences, and they listen to it, but I don't know whether they pursue it. Let me indicate another lesson that is derived from the Day of Atonement, the high, uh, most solemn, highest day of the Jewish calendar. Towards the evening, every synagogue reads the book of Jonah. What a book! Professor Cornel, a Protestant theologian I read as a youth, said that he never reads the book of Jonah without tears coming to his eyes. He says he knows that Jonah ultimately is to be saved. He knows that he's not going to be swallowed up by that big fish. But what a lesson. Jonah is a super patriot. God sends him on an errand to the people of Nineveh telling them that their corruption and evil is beyond endurance. It's going to destroy the city of Nineveh unless they repent. And this super patriot rejoices. At last, the enemy of his people is going to be destroyed. So he pays his passage on a ship going to Jaffa, leaving Jaffa to Sharshish, runs away from God. I don't want to tell you the whole story, I want you to read it. So I'll be, <laughs> so I'll be very brief. What happens? The ship is about to drown, to go down. The mariners pray. And then he says, it's on my account. The Lord is after me. Dump me and the sea will be gentle and you will be on your way. The mariners are God's fearing people. They will go down to the sea in ships shall see the wonders of the Lord, says the psalmist. Sooner than later they realize that they have to do what he wants. So he's dumped, and then he's in the belly of the sh It's not a whale. The Bible says, Dagadol, a big fish. In the folk he it's a whale. And then he spewed out a on the dry land and finds himself in Nineveh. And he marches around. 
from one end of the city to the other, within 30 days, Nineveh will be destroyed because of its evil. The king calls the solemn assembly, they fast and they pray, and the Bible stresses they resolve to turn away from their evil ways. They're going to change their way of life. The city is not destroyed. Nanve survives, and the prophet is still the great patriot. I'm afraid of great patriots. Patriotism in moderation. <laughs> God before man. God before industry. So uh, he uh, sits there, and the Bible says, um, if I had time, read the book, because there's some very nuances, interesting nuances. What happens was, uh, he's always catching a few naps. What is it, when you sleep a little bit? Uh, he's, uh, whenever he gets a chance on the boat, an older man, he can't stay awake too long. So again, he takes a nap, and uh, uh, the sun hits his forehead, and he's discomforted. And then the story goes, a plant grows up, they call it a good, I never saw one in my life, but it's a big plant that covers his head and he's very confident. And then a worm eats up the plant in a short time. And um, again the heat, the sun strikes him. And God speaks to him and says, Jonah, are you very angry? He says, I could die. Americans would say I could spit or something like that. <laughs> I could die. <laughs> and God said, listen, Jonah, you took pity on this plant, which grows overnight and perishes overnight. Shall I not take pity on the city of Nineveh, which has 120,000 men, women, and children and many beasts. Thus ends the story of Jonah. If we could only say it from all the pulpits of the country before election, this is a time of a, a national consensus, soul taking, soul searching. Guns will not solve the problem of world peace. No matter how many, no matter how many new Neutron weapons we create, that will not solve the problem. There is hunger in the land. Ten million or more people are out of work. Their dignity as human beings is destroyed. Their family life is being shattered. Guns before bread? No. To go to the you know, church or synagogue, as one of my Christian friends said, it goes to be smoothed out in the church. That's not the job of the church to smooth people out. The, the prophet said he came on a very important day of concern. People were facing a crisis. So what did the prophet say? It isn't prayer. It isn't bowing your head. That's not real religion. Real religion is to break your bread with the hungry to clothe the naked, to see that society is just, not to cultivate great animosity for those nations that are not your way of life. Nineveh was the enemy of Jerusalem, and God said, I have compassion on Nineveh. Too much bitterness, too much hostility. And therefore, whatever years the Lord spares me, I shall try to talk to my Christian colleagues and say, look at the prophets of Israel. Don't just be priests. It's a good function to be a priest, to hallow the moments of life, birth, marriage, death. Basically, what you have to teach your people is to live with brotherhood and compassion and love, and concretely so concretely so, not to be vague. That, I think, is the message, the prophetic message, that is not heard in the land, certainly not on television. Turn on those programs. I, I feel distressed with all the hogwash that is being 
presented to the people as religion. If you uh, believe, uh, you will get rich very quick. Um, you will um, be in perfect health all your life. Everything that you ask will be fulfilled. Nonsense. That's not religion. Job is religion. Jeremiah is religion. Jesus in his concern for the downtrodden, the poor, the rejected, that's religion. This is what the country needs. That's not what it's getting. I'm afraid it will not get it for a long time to come. Come thou, O light and will.